If you're a consistent person that plays a lot of video games, then you might have heard somewhere across your life of Team Fortress 2. Across its 14 year lifespan, Team Fortress 2 has been some of the most popular video games on Steam. You may have heard of it, you may have watched it, you may have played it. People play and interact with the 9 red and blue mercenaries every day, sometimes even cosplaying as the characters in real life. Something about the characters and their writing just clicked to make it so perfect and comical. TF2 is one of the few multiplayer shooter games that has truly fleshed out characters. Hardcore Team Fortress 2 gamers might just know everything about the 9 playable classes. But one of the most seemingly obvious character traits these 9 mercenaries all have is generally most of the time not seen. See, behind all of the goofy characters, the excellent writing, and the funny jokes the community has made along the way, behind all of the comical gags and enjoyable personalities each of the classes hold, are nine mentally disturbed individuals of the human condition. Psychosis, schizophrenia, paranoia, all of which are one of the many thousands of illnesses the human condition could have. In the United States, for every five people that are born, one of them will be born with or develop a mental illness. The hardest part about helping individuals with the human condition is trying to understand what exactly they're dealing with. The truth is, is that the average person just doesn't really know exactly what they're dealing with. We don't get it, we don't feel it, we just don't understand what they go through in life. For the people that's jobs are to help the mentally unwell, there are a variety of methods helping them get through the day. Therapy, psychoanalysis, medication, all very useful tools if you ever want to help the people that need it. However, while these tools all might be very handy when you need them, it still doesn't exactly connect you with them on what specifically they are experiencing throughout their life. A way for someone that is mentally unwell to express themselves in a more bald way is art and creations. Ever since the 1900s, art created by the unwell has been an occasionally helpful tool if you ever wanted to attempt to connect with them. It shows just a little slice of what they are thinking right now, how they view the world and the people around them. More recently in the 2010s, however, video games seem to have been added to the list of trying to understand the human condition. While not always precisely accurate, video games discussing the unwell just might be the best way for the stable to connect with the unstable. Most of the time the purpose of video games is for you to be immersed in another world. A reality where you can play as someone that is completely different from you in every way. By making the player play as a mentally ill protagonist, it helps them sort of immerse and connect themselves into what people with the human condition might be like. While some games may be bad at betraying it, others can be more accurate. An unfortunately common mental illness people might suffer from is depression. While some of us without it may have a general guess on what it is, we still don't have any clear understanding on how it feels to be that way. So how does Google define it? Well, according to Google, depression is the feeling of severe despondency and dejection. Again, easy to grasp the concept, but hard to understand it. There are many forms of depression, like from what I call depressive solitude, which is basically the feelings of dejection due to isolation. There have been many characters, some funny and others serious, that try to depict and portray this type of depression. At its worst, depression can seriously start to have a toll on you and how you see the world mentally. And in my eyes, no other video game or show character portrays it better than Simon Henriksen. While not the most accurate depiction of depression, the character Simon Henriksen is probably the closest we'll ever get to visualizing what depression can do to you at its worst. In the game Cry of Fear, you are put into the boots of Simon in a city full of monsters. In this game, nowhere you go feels safe. Hallways in Cry of Fear will often be cruelly barred off. Walls often bleed and areas you once explored now change entirely. With that being said, it can be easy to list off Cry of Fear as a solid horror game. But in my eyes, that doesn't really do this game justice to just how great it is. Because where Cry of Fear shines is its way of storytelling. More specifically, its way of unraveling a much more sinister story than the one playing out. As while it might not seem like it at first, once you piece together the true story, Cry of Fear is eventually revealed to be a morbid take on depression. One of the many common occurrences you'll feel in this game is feeling lonely. Throughout the game, you will experience a lot of loneliness at times. Whether that's you quite literally being alone, or feeling like you have no one to guide or help you. You're on your own for the entirety of the game. And while sparsely it can be peaceful in certain scenarios, most of the time it can get more existential than being relaxing. There are normal humans in Cry of Fear, but even then they are not so friendly. 
One of the people you find in this game is the Doctor. A man that doesn't exactly cause direct harm to you for the first few hours, but does show signs of questionable behavior. During the game, you will always be just out of reach with the Doctor. Your first encounter with him is incredibly dodgy to Simon, standing in the corner of the room talking about how he can't trust you. He also goes on to imply that there's an infection breaking out in the city, as he's wearing a gas mask, making us believe this game is actually about an apocalypse more than anything else. And as you encounter him more and more, it becomes apparent that he isn't friendly. By the time you leave the city and enter into an asylum, you encounter the doctor once more and you're given a choice. You can either find a gun for the doctor to open up the door, or resist his order to do it. Either way, you get shot in the shoulder by him and proceeds to run into the attic. A pretty long boss fight occurs and then you end up killing him. The next person is Sophie, the only consistent friendly figure Simon has met up to this point. With the only scene of Simon and Sophie together, he tells Sophie about his love towards her. She rejects him and then commits suicide shortly after. The rest of the people in the game are other dead corpses, disfigured monsters, or even Simon himself, which we'll get back to later. The thing is, however, is that all of the people and the actions that they do in this game are nothing more than a metaphor to the actual true story. Going further into the game, you will be given hints and clues as to what actually is happening in Cry of Fear. The game frequently gives Simon visions of him in a seemingly different world, from how he was hit by a car trying to help an old man, to hearing a therapist talk about him and his mental state. Hallucinations occur throughout the game, where seemingly normal hallways suddenly turn into disfigured nightmare fuel. Walls and rooms suddenly contort being completely incoherent, all while these incredibly warped figures try desperately to kill you. And yet, all of this is nothing more than a metaphor. Eventually, after finding your way through a small town to try and get back home, you enter the house and all of a sudden you are up against your real self. Here is where the real story happens. The Simon you played as throughout the entire game was revealed to be a form of you written in a book. In the beginning, Simon was shown to be an incredibly depressive figure. Everything, however, was about to get a lot worse for him. As upon trying to help a mysterious old man, he would then be hit by a car, causing him to become permanently paraplegic. Naturally, he would go to a doctor to see if he can fix his mental state. As a therapy lesson, Simon is given a book to try and write down his feelings. The doctor in the book of Cry Fear being dodgy and almost even killing Simon is how the real Simon vision is therapist. Sophie committing suicide on the rooftops was Simon's way of interpreting his rejection. In this place where you get a stun baton, there's a page that talks about helping out with depression, with a phone number listed on it. Upon calling it, Simon probably expected to get some proper help this time, but as per usual, the help he was getting wasn't exactly working, if at all. And while it did seem to work for the meantime as the door soon opened, it still left him feeling incredibly broken. Figures he sees throughout the game that he shoots are most likely people that surrounded Simon in his everyday life. People that he assumed were antagonizing him behind his back. While the rest of the areas in Cry Fear are all morbid interpretations of how Simon viewed the world, the endings in Cry Fear are also not great with some ending up with Simon suiciding, killing either Sophie, the doctor, or both along the way, or the fourth ending, killing two cops as a result of a psychosis, resulting in him being permanently put into a mental asylum for life, concluding the story of Simon. Cry of Fear at its core is a story about depression and how it can affect you. Simon Henriksen is the result of depression at its absolute worst. According to the wiki, Simon seems to suffer from just depression alone, and it doesn't exactly help that he was hit by a car during all of this, causing his depression to spiral even more out of control. Having this state of mentality transform into a video game can be a great way for the average person to analyze the condition. And while not exactly accurate to real life scenarios, this game is just one of the many titles that try to portray the human condition. However, let's take a step back and look at the opposite end of the spectrum, insanity. The insane side of the human condition is more often than not the least fleshed out. Throughout the various shows and video games of online media, a character trait that is usually underutilized is a character that betrays what it is to be insane. A problem with crazy figures across all media is their general unwillingness to change outside of that single trait. Most of the time when lunatic characters are made, they will always be betrayed as just that. What's even harder to do is to actually make them seem human. Without any means of fleshing out the madness of characters, it can only end up resulting in a heavily one-dimensional figure. Due to this, it can start to feel really repetitive when every depiction of insanity is the exact same over and over again. So how do you make a good psychopath? More specifically, how do you humanize an insane individual? To answer this question, we're gonna have to go back to a certain first-person shooter. Going back to Team Fortress 2, I would like to ask you a tricky question. Out of all of the nine playable mercenaries in TF2, which one is the most insane? 
Now, this could be answered differently from person to person. You might think it's Pyro for burning down everything in its path without even realizing it. You might think it's Soldier for his general PTSD and motive to massacre people by the thousands. Or Demo, who is basically in all practicalities a drunk terrorist. Those are all pretty good guesses. But in my eyes, to figure out how to characterize a psychopath, you must look no further than the maniac that is the medic from Team Fortress 2. What happens now? Now? <laughs> Let's go practice medicine. I am the angry bird god of the badlands! We are here! Are you sure this will work? I have no idea! The medic from TF2 is the living embodiment of how to professionally humanize a psychopath. Despite being the healing and support class for the team, the medic is possibly the most insane and unstable psychopath out of all of the characters in the game. And it might be kind of hard to see why at first. On paper, the medic doesn't really differentiate himself from the other eight mercenaries. According to the Team Fortress page, prior to even joining the team, medic was seen as a high-class doctor born somewhere in the regions of Stuttgart, Germany. In-game, he can actually be an incredibly helpful individual, healing the team quickly one by one at will, and can at times be the key factor to who wins the round, all while being a generally comedic and funny character in the process. So on paper, it might seem like Medic is actually the sanest out of all the team, but in practice, that couldn't be farther from the truth. As the years went on in Team Fortress 2's development, the Medic's true character started to reveal more and more. In the YouTube video Meet the Medic, Medic tells the iconic story to Heavy of how he implies that he lost his medical license due to stealing a man's skeleton. In the Team Fortress 2 comics, Medic is suddenly transferred to Hell after abruptly dying, and negotiates with the Devil to go back to Earth by claiming his nine souls, trading one of them with the Devil's pen. Medic on top of that is also prone to be incredibly violent and unethical, being able to go on a killing spree with his bone saw and needle gun. Of course, he actually isn't very good at doing that in-game, but he can do it. And the list goes on, shoving gigantic hearts down people's open chest, and not even putting on clean gloves for his operations. However, even these are pitiful to what Medic is actually capable of, because it's also not hard to see that Medic can downright play God at times. Things like severing Spy's head and having it live, and many more countless examples. In the Halloween event in TF2, you were allowed to wear a cosmetic for the class known as the Second Opinion, a seemingly average Halloween appearance until you factor in the voice lines. Upon having this equipped and dominating people in-game, the Sonin part of Medic can be heard at times telling him to do things like kill all of his friends. And while all of these attributes are for the most part moderately crazy, not even those come close to the Medic's most important and downright psychotic creation of all time, the Uber Charge. With the simple flick of a switch on the Medigun, the Medic can create enough power to Uber Charge someone. An element where, for a very brief moment, you could become invincible and are rendered immune to in and all coming damage, allowing the host to go on huge rampages as there's basically nothing no one could do to stop the unkillable force. With this in mind, it's not hard to see why the Uber Charge in a round is a serious game changer. Unless you already prepared beforehand or even have a method of killing off the Uber Charge, there isn't really much you can do other than to run and hide. The Medic's Uber Charge is powerful and has been the subject of numerous victories for countless of teams. The Uber Charge single-handedly can bridge the gap between a strong defense, offense, or stalemate. So with all of these character traits in mind that the Medic has, it can be pretty reasonable to conclude that the Medic is downright insane. Whether if it's him going on complete massacres, playing God, or just being an all-around grotesque individual, it's very clear that Medic is by far the most psychotic mercenary out of all of the nine team members. And yet, not a lot of people really bother to notice. Despite the outrageous crimes against humanity Medic seems to commit, and all of the downright deplorable creations that the Medic innovates, most people still in practice don't really seem to notice just how insane he really is. In fact, people actually seem to find the Medic more charming in most cases than actually a psychopath. Instead of seeing him as a mad lunatic doctor, people more often than not see him rather as a funny, helpful, and even friendly figure which can all be tied back to just how well the TF2 developers fleshed out and characterized the supposed Mac Doctor. Due to the amazing character development of the Medic, people not only seem to resonate with the Medic, but outright forget how insane he actually is, seeing him most of the time as a charismatic and helpful individual. Comedy also tends to help give character to Medic. Throughout the various TF2 videos on YouTube, you will often come across hundreds of videos of Medic being betrayed as a meme, hero, or friend, 
rarely ever dissecting the insane part of him in most of the videos. Because of this, Medic is essentially the peak of humanized insanity. He shows us that not all maniacs have to be betrayed in the same way. Sometimes they could be fleshed out and characterized into a proper human. Medic also tells people that you don't have to see them as just lunatics. As I've stated before, most people just seem to forget that Medic was a maniac in the first place, and see him really more as comical rather than threatening. Team Fortress 2 is amazing for many reasons, but one of them is just how amazingly fleshed out they managed to make these 9 crazy lunatics, and especially the Medic. So if you ever want to know how to create a brilliant maniac, a good starting page is to look at the surreal inner workings of the medical doctor from TF2. On the subject of Valve with their amazingly fleshed out characters, another often underrated maniac that Valve created was shipped along with the influential FPS series, Half-Life 2. In the middle of the game, after escaping Eli's base in the chapter Black Mesa East, you explore into the depths of an abandoned town at night, Ravenholm, where in the midst of it, you find someone like Father Grigori. Father Grigori in hindsight was very underutilized, you didn't really see him all that much throughout the game, and when you did, he was usually out of reach from the player. By the time you meet him, you only explore another area with him before eventually departing with the guy, never to be seen again. But with the little screen time that he was given, Father Grigori nailed the betrayal of a truly distraught figure. The only way to really sum him up is being religiously insane. Grigori is a heavy believer in faith, and it seems his religious beliefs would only get stronger now with the influence of zombies. By the time the player goes to Ravenholm, it's nothing more than a foggy town infected with headcrabs. But through subtle dialogue and environment, it can slowly be revealed to the story of what Ravenholm originally was. Ravenholm, according to Alex, used to be an old mining town near the coast around Eli's base. But as time passed, it would gradually start to be used as a safe haven. A town for refugees to flee the oppressive force of the Combine. A universal empire in Half-Life 2 that was so utterly powerful, it managed to fully conquer the planet in just seven hours. With the massive oppression of the Combine Force in any surviving cities, hundreds of thousands of people would flock to Ravenholm, with Grigori most likely being either the leader or priest of the town, as churches can be seen everywhere. And for a while, it would seem that Ravenholm would be used as a major ground for the resistance. But unfortunately, as luck would have it, the Combine would eventually detect the town after some time. In response, the Combine would deploy several canisters harboring headcrabs, small alien creatures that if latched onto your head could completely turn people into zombified corpses. In an instant, the whole town was thrusted into chaos. You never get to witness the massacre at day one, only the aftermath. Ever since the unseen attack, what remains in Ravenholm are empty streets filled with headcrab zombies. Noting this, it's also reasonable that Father Grigori is the last survivor of Ravenholm, which now brings us to his current mental state. The only effective word I can use to describe Father Grigori is traumatized. Having witnessed all of his people get slowly slaughtered and zombified has probably severely affected him. During your time in Ravenholm, you can hear Grigori chanting to himself about unconnected and random biblical references. When he spots you, he often refers to you as his brother. Of course, being in a town full of newly infected zombies, you're gonna have to be a bit nimble in order to survive. Father Grigori for the most part is only really seen on roofs, but he can also be occasionally seen in windows, shooting zombies out of a building, etc. According to the wiki for Half-Life 2, Father Grigori suffers from a form of chronic reactive psychosis, a human condition of how you're affected under a traumatic situation. He's also prone to maniacally laugh out of nowhere. When he ends up killing a zombie, he will mourn the corpse and say that they can rest now. With all that being said, you can't really help but feel bad for the guy. Grigori is an excellent video game example of how to portray the traumatic side of the human condition. With nothing to lose, Grigori decides to help the player out. He gives him a shotgun and lets him make use of the various traps he planted to kill the zombies. And eventually, just when things looked bright, he leaves himself behind and runs away into the flames of a distant fire. And we never get to see him again past that point. Father Grigori was an incredibly unique character to the Half-Life series. He was only ever seen in one chapter in the game, and was generally underutilized. But even with that, he managed to seemingly embody what it was like to live with pure trauma. The human condition where you experience something so distressing, it can start to change you. It also doesn't help that he most likely felt incredibly isolated. Nothing but your thoughts and a bunch of reanimated corpses would probably also further promote his insanity. There are tiny theories out there that Grigori might still be alive in the minds of episode two. But other than that, you never see him past this point. But maybe it's for the better. Trying to help Grigori from his personal trauma is about as hard as it sounds. Anyways, you leave him behind in the flames as you go into the mines of an infested cave. 
you escape the mines into the outskirts and eventually drive off into the coast, never to return to that mysterious old mining town. There was, almost for a while, a development of an entire Ravenholm game. Made by Arkan Studios, the game was originally supposed to be served as a successor to Ravenholm, but that was cut prematurely. Who knows? We may have gone to see what exactly happened to the town, what happened to Grigori and how he survived the zombie apocalypse, but we may never know. All that's left of the old guy was that one surreal chapter back in 2004. Rest well, Grigori. You will be missed. As we've covered before, chronic past trauma is an incredibly horrible experience to anyone that has it. With that being said though, people tend to have different types of trauma depending on the situation. Going back to the last character, Father Grigori seemed to suffer from pure trauma as a result of having to witness all of his people become zombified. But what other forms of trauma are there? Well, another unfortunately common form of trauma can be seen in the people that had a rough childhood. This can range from having to deal with the abandonment of a mother or father, the family resorting to a life of drugs, or just a general amount of child neglect. And while most people that grow up with this experience just one or the other, what were to happen if a person grew up experiencing all three of these major issues? Well, in the eyes of the video game world, you have someone like Trevor Phillip. Family. Yeah, well, I got nothing! No one gives a fuck about me! To the eyes of a stranger that doesn't have the context for Trevor's character, they'll mostly just see him as nothing more than a reckless and frustrated psychopath. Which, fair enough. In the game GTA V, one of the many characters you get to play as is, sure enough, Trevor. Throughout the game, Trevor is seen to do things ranging from kidnapping hostages, to robbing banks, committing manslaughter, smuggling drugs, and many more other examples. On top of that, Trevor's personality traits can also mainly revolve around being short-tempered and mindless. Using this info, you can't really think that Trevor is exactly a saint. But with that being said, you'll quickly find out when looking at his background the dark reasons for his behavior. And as you go through and complete the game, you can't help but feel pity for Trevor as you begin to piece together his backstory. The overall result of Trevor can mostly be tracked down back to his childhood. As a child, Trevor had to deal with the constant abuse of his parents, as his father would physically abuse him while his mom would emotionally abuse him, relentlessly tormenting him on how he wasn't good enough and how she was never proud of him ever in her life. Eventually, later in his life, his dad would presumably abandon him while his mother would partake in prostitution, all while he had to transfer to multiple different schools throughout his childhood. These early issues that Trevor had to grow up with would eventually shape him into who he is now. Later on, as the years went by, Trevor's internal anger would eventually let out, and he would get so utterly frustrated he would take out his anger on other living beings. At first starting out with simple animals, before going on to attack other people like his hockey coach, and eventually going on to presumably kill his own brother. If there was one thing that Trevor found himself to be good at, it was aviation. Soon in his early adult life, Trevor partook in the military and wanted to begin a career of military flying, as he noticed that he had a natural talent with planes. But due to his obvious mental issues, the military rejected him, leaving him out of a job. With no other choice that Trevor found himself passionate about, he decided to resort to a life of bank robberies and other various crimes, making friends and partners along the way such as the infamous Michael. At this moment, this was his turning point in life, and there was no going back. And soon later in the early 2010s, Trevor began a life of selling drugs using his newly made company, Trevor Phillips Enterprise. Knowing all of his backstory now, it can start to be reasonable to know why Trevor Phillips is where he is today. By no means is what he ever does good and should never be given sympathy to. But people can now at least acknowledge why he does the things he does. Trevor lived an incredibly traumatized past, and his actions reflect that. Even in his adult life, he still finds himself getting addicted to alcohol and drugs, and frequently self-loathes in isolation. And yet, even with all of these bad actions, Trevor does have a few morals that he frequently shows. A saving grace from Trevor is that he's incredibly loyal, whether if it was him refusing to let Michael be kicked out of the group, to rarely, if at all, never lying. Anywho, the rest of the game now revolves around the life of crime that Trevor has put himself through. He meets other people along the way like his other infamous friend, Franklin Clinton. But eventually, trauma and tension start appearing and affecting the group, which results in two of the three endings for GTA having Franklin either kill Michael or Trevor. If you wish to kill Trevor, well, he dies in an extremely dramatic way. This is weird, but from my eyes and a bunch of other people that I've noticed throughout the various comments, despite how utterly vile of a human Trevor is, 
You can't help but feel bad for him when he occasionally breaks throughout the game. And it just makes me question, why do I feel bad for him despite all the things that he's done? This isn't just me, as there's also a lot of other people that seem to agree. I can't really find myself having a solid answer for that, but whatever the reason might be, Trevor shows us that even if you're as despicable and vile as someone like him, it is still possible to resonate, connect, and pity with someone like Trevor. We don't know the definitive true ending for GTA 5, or for that matter, what happens after their fate. But if you choose the Death Wish ending where all three of them are still alive, after putting Wesson in a car and pushing it off a cliff, they simply say their goodbyes to each other while Michael and Franklin drive off, leaving only Trevor behind as his fate is left ambiguous. Maybe once GTA 6 releases that we'll actually know what happens to the three guys. But until then, we are only left to speculate, putting a close to one of the most amazingly well-written psychopaths in all of video game history. A thing or two to learn from this video is that video games can be great for depicting the human condition. While never always precisely accurate, video games are by far the most consistent method of understanding the unwell. Whether it be exploring the nature of depression, figuring out how to humanize a maniac, or accurately depicting traumatic people, video games seem to be the new way of exploring these grim topics. A thing that has always been hard about understanding the unwell is the disconnect between what it actually feels like to be like them. With the gaming revolution sweeping the 21st century, one by one characters all over the industry are being understood with by average people. I hope you enjoyed this analysis of video game characters, as I plan to do more of this in the foreseeable future. I will be the first to say that this video is inherently flawed. I'm not a therapist or psychiatrist, so who knows? I might just be talking about random nonsense. I don't know a thing about depression, isolation, trauma, or even figuring out what makes a good maniac. But nonetheless, I hope I was able to do my best at depicting a fairly morbid topic through the art of gaming. A quick honorable mention to characters like Eric Cartman who didn't make it in this video. A kid who quite possibly has every single deranged and unwell trait a single person could ever have. I mean hell, there are entire videos out there that are dedicated to understanding just how awful Eric can be. There isn't really much else to say about him past that, he's just a really odd character. But yeah, that's about all I have to say. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you sometime in the future. Goodbye. You ask me why I'm wandering these streets? Why I'm carrying a gun? I can't answer. Doctor was never heard of again! That's how I lost my medical license. <laughs> As for me, a shepherd must tend to his flock, especially when they have grown unruly. Yeah, well, Where the fuck did you come back? Oh, sorry! Oh, dang, I'm a fucking... Shut up, Ron. Ah.